Salvation Army. Please, Salvation Army, I implore you. Salvation Army, be what God created you to be. Some weeks ago, we had a gentleman, British gentleman, a lord of the realm called Lord Hattersley, speaking in a Salvation Army meeting. Now, what was he doing there, especially as he's not a Christian and certainly not a Salvationist? What was he doing in the Westminster Central Hall with 2,000 Salvationists? He was there because he's written a new book. Lord Hattersley is a politician. He was the deputy leader of the Labour Party for many years. And now he's in the House of Lords in Great Britain. What was he doing in the Westminster Central Hall? He's written a book. And his book, strangely enough, has the title Blood and Fire. Rather unusual for a politician to write a book with a title like that, don't you think? And underneath the title it says Blood and Fire, William and Catherine Booth and their Salvation Army. I was curious, of course. Lord Hattersley had been to see me. And he'd asked if he could do this book. And I said, what's it going to be about? He said, I'm not sure, but I'm going to do some research. Can I go in the archives of the Salvation Army and read anything I like? I said, yes, anything you like. He read everything he liked. He was in there for months, and he produced this book about the Salvation Army. And he came to the Westminster Central Hall at my invitation to be interviewed by one of our captains. And the captain asked him some very pertinent questions. And they were very direct because the book isn't all in praise of the Salvation Army, but he does give a very good balanced view of the Salvation Army from its birth until now. Now, when the interview was over, and everybody was very excited because he spoke very well as a politician always can. Whatever they do, they always speak well, don't they? He spoke very well indeed. And then the captain made the mistake, well, it was a, a, a risk anyway, if not a mistake, to say to the politician, to Lord Hattersley, Lord Hattersley, you have a couple of thousand Salvation Army people here. Have you got a message for this Salvation Army? You've studied the army, you've read about it, you've come close to it, you've discovered it, you say. Now, what would be your message to this Salvation Army? And you know what Lord Hattersley said? He said, oh, Salvation Army. Be what God created you to be. And don't apologize for it. Oh, I love that last bit. We're so apologetic in the army. We're no good. The Baptists are better. The Pentecostalists are better. We don't sing as well as Hillsong. And we go on and on running ourselves down. We're not much good. Do excuse us for living, you know. And here is a politician who studied the army and is a man of this world and isn't a believer, but he says, please, Salvation Army, be what you were created to be. The world needs a Salvation Army. Like you are, stop apologizing. I thought that was lovely. And as I steal anything that's any good, I've stolen Lord Hattersley's words. And I'm going round the world now saying, please, Salvation Army, I implore you, be what God created you to be. Be what God meant you to be. What you're called to be. You see the temptation of all inspired movements, not excluding the Salvation Army. The temptation of all inspired movements is to forget what they were made for and to wander away from their primary ambition and to become something else, something less beautiful, something less useful than they were intended to be. The Salvation Army has begun to apologize for itself at a time when the world needs a Salvation Army. You may be asking what exactly was the Salvation Army created for. What is its raison d'etre? Well, I'll tell you what it is in my view. I believe, I put my hand on my heart, I believe the Salvation Army was created to achieve three things. And I'm going to tell you what they are. 
And in the next three years of my generalship, you will hear me say it a thousand times. The Salvation Army was created by God. I believe that to start with. It wasn't William Booth's idea. It was God's idea. And he got William and Catherine to put it into action. But it was God's idea. And God created the Salvation Army to achieve three things. And the first one of these, and I hope it doesn't surprise anybody here, the first reason why God created the Salvation Army, he created it to save souls. Does that surprise anybody? I hope not. The Salvation Army came into being to save souls, to rescue people from sin, to rescue people from mediocrity, to rescue people from materialism. To rescue people from meaningless, pointless living. The Salvation Army was created to save souls. That's why God made it Salvation Army. I implore you, be what God made you to be. And secondly, the Salvation Army was created. And I hope you're sitting comfortably. I don't want to shock anybody. But the Salvation Army was created to grow saints. The Salvation Army is supposed to be a hot house for growing saints. God intended the Salvation Army to be a garden in which people grew into beautiful people. Lovely people, beautiful people, people who were generous and kind and forgiving and sympathetic and pure and honest, gentle, compassionate, sympathetic, loving, forgiving, Christ-like. God intended to produce a salvation army that would grow beautiful people. And if the salvation army is not growing beautiful people, it is not being what God created it to be. The Salvation Army is a holiness movement for producing holy people who act like Jesus and forgive like Jesus and give like Jesus and work like Jesus and love like Jesus and suffer and sacrifice like Jesus. The Salvation Army was created to do that and if the army isn't doing that, I implore it in Jesus' name, as its international leader. Oh, Salvation Army, be what God created you to be, a hot house for holiness. And thirdly, this surprises nobody. The Salvation Army was created to serve suffering humanity without question. Wherever anyone is hurting, the Salvation Army should be there. That's part of our calling. And when we're not serving, suffering humanity, we are something less, something else than the Salvation Army. I am sorry to say that the Army isn't exactly what God intended it to be everywhere. There are some Salvation Army Corps that are more like clubs than anything else. I have to tell you, and I've been in the Salvation Army as an officer for 45 years, I have to tell you I can take you to Salvation Army Corps where they don't save souls. They don't grow saints. And they do nothing for suffering humanity. Now you can take me, if you like, to a beautiful building with a Salvation Army crest on the side, full of smartly dressed people in Salvation Army uniform. But if that unit is not producing people who save souls, who are growing like Jesus and who are desperately trying to do something for the suffering of these wor this world, then you have not a Salvation Army call there. You have not a Salvation Army. Call it something else. These three fundamental passions are what have made the Salvation Army. 
And the devil loves to prevent us from being what God intends us to be. Oh, the devil's clever. I hope you've got a respect for the devil. Do you believe in the devil? I believe in the devil. The devil follows me around. He sits in my office. Oh, he does. One of my predecessors, the illustrious General Osborne, used to tap his shoulders and say, the general is subject to the domination, the irritation, the temptation of the devil. And the devil, he used to say, loves velvet. <laughs> oh, the devil doesn't leave me alone. He comes to all my meetings. I'm sorry, folks, you're in good company tonight. He never misses one of my meetings. He's always there, contradicting everything I say. I say, God loves you, and he whispers in somebody's ear, don't believe it, it's a lot of rubbish. Oh, the devil comes to all my meetings. I wish he'd stay away. Don't you? Does he come to your meetings? Perhaps he doesn't need to. He certainly comes to mine. <laughs> he doesn't waste his time, you know. I'm, so, I'm sure there are one or two calls that he doesn't bother about at all. Why should he worry they're safe? <laughs> they won't do him any harm. No, I've got a great respect for the devil. I'll tell you why. There's two good things. You can always say something about the devil that's good. And I'll tell you two things and that I have an admiration for. The devil is industrious. He's not lazy. You've got to admire it. He never goes on holiday. He's hard at work in season and out of season to do his damaging and dastardly work. And the other thing you've got to say that's good about the devil is that he's clever. Oh, isn't he clever? He's cunning. And one of his ambitions, I'll swear to you, I know him well, one of his ambitions is to demolish the Salvation Army. Well, if you were the devil, wouldn't you like to demolish the Salvation Army? You'd be not very bright as a devil if you didn't try and demolish the Salvation Army. I mean, the Salvation Army is a dangerous thing to hell, you know. Hell can't hear of the Salvation Army without going into fits of rage. If you were the devil, you'd like to demolish the Salvation Army, but the trouble with the Salvation Army is it's very hard to demolish. When you've got a Salvation Army in 106 countries, you can't really demolish it, you see, because by the time you've strangled it almost in a little country in Europe, it breaks out in India and has a revival, and you just think you've sat on India. When Africa takes fire, the devil's going crazy. He can't demolish the blessed thing. He can't demolish it, but oh, he's clever. So do you know what he does? I've watched him do it. He doesn't demolish it. That's a bit too hard even for the devil. But he... He makes it deviate from its true path. He knows that this is what God created the Salvation Army to be. And the devil says, well, just turn a little bit to the left or the right. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. And before we know where we are, he's diverted us from our first intention so much that we're going in the opposite direction. Now that's clever. And he's had some success with this Salvation Army. Because in some places, he has managed to make the Salvation Army something it wasn't intended to be and to prevent it from being what it was intended to be by getting it to major on minor matters and to get excited about peripheral things that have no significance. And Salvationists are using all their God-given energy on rubbishy things while the main things are not receiving the attention that it should have. We should stop trifling with peripheral things that have no significance and concentrate on winning souls and growing saints and serving suffering humanity. And don't let the devil detour us from these first things.
Why is it that the Salvation Army in some places is less than what it should be? Isn't very effective in these three areas? Well, perhaps it's because we've forgotten what Catherine Booth called the great fundamental principle. I want to read to you something that the mother of the Salvation Army said. Now, when mother talks, the children listen. Okay, so this is our mother speaking. And she's talking sense, as most mothers do. They asked her why the Salvation Army was so successful. And she said this. The Army's achievements were built on the great fundamental principle of adaptation. That is, making the means suit the end. She goes on to say, God forbid that I should ever teach any adaptation of the gospel. I teach no adaptation of the gospel. But I contend that we may serve it up on any sort of dish that will suit the people and encourage them to partake of it. She's talking here about menus and dishes. And she says the Salvation Army only has one menu. We serve up the gospel. But, she says, if we've got any intelligence, we'll serve it up on any kind of dish. A green dish, a long dish, a short dish, a yellow dish, a dish with yellow spots. We'll use any dish we can to get them to eat it. Now this is the great fundamental principle of adaptation. And our mother said we grew when we remembered the great fundamental principle of adaptation, flexibility, change of methods. We never change the gospel, but we're altering the method all the time so that we might win other people for Jesus. And we don't care what dish we use as long as they eat it. Now this is the salvation army. And this is why we were so good in days gone by. We were so flexible. We'd do anything. We'd stand on our heads. For goodness sake, when William Booth was taking the liner, I think it was out of Australia, going home, he'd had a demonstration on the beach and there'd been one of those uh, kind of holy uh, uh, hallelujah dancers. And Rudyard Kipling, the great English literature man, and writer said to William Booth, well, you made a bit of a fool of yourself on the beach, didn't you, before you got on the boat, all those drums and tambourines. And William Booth said to Rudyard Kipling, if I could win one more soul by standing on my head and beating the tambourine with my toes, I'd learn how to do it. Now, that's the Salvation Army you belong to. And if you belong to something else, you don't belong to the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army is an army of people who will stand on their heads to get somebody saved. The method doesn't matter. We've got so rigid. We've got fixed patterns. That's not the Salvation Army. We need to be adaptable and to adapt our methods to the people we want to win. Now, Catherine Booth believed in the great fundamental principle of adaptation. And she said the army was successful when it was the most concerned with adaptability. But she didn't invent it, you know. I'm not the only one that steals other people's ideas. Catherine stole this one. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Mother. You got it from somewhere else, didn't you? Yes, she says, I get it from somewhere else. I got it from a, an early day salvationist called Paul. Saint Paul, to be exact. 
St. Paul? Well, yes, he was the first Salvationist. He was a Salvationist before there was a Salvation Army. He was number one on the roll before we had a roll to put his name on. But St. Paul was the first Salvationist. Listen to St. Paul. And I'm reading now from Corinthians. Listen to St. Paul. I'm a free man, says St. Paul. And I own no master. But I have made myself every man's servant to win over as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. As they are subject to the law of Moses, I put myself under that law to win them, although I'm not myself subject to it. To win Gentiles who are outside the law, I made myself like one of them, although I'm not, in fact, outside God's law, being under the law of Christ. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Indeed, I have become everything in turn to men of every sort, so that in one way or another I may save some. That's the salvationist speaking. And the Salvation Army is going to start speaking like that again. We've got to save them somehow. Desperate we need to be. Willing to become all things to all men. If by any means I can save some. The Salvation Army isn't desperate enough. It's unwilling to try the unusual or the non-palatable or the un pleasant or the not comfortable. We're looking always for some easy way to save souls that doesn't cost us anything or hurt our sensibilities and we've got to get to the stage where we're willing to do anything God helping us to save some. That's the Salvation Army you belong to and if you think it's some sort of army other than that you're making a mistake. We were invented by God the Holy Spirit to save souls and to use any legal method, however outrageous, however outlandish, to save some. It is where the Salvation Army is doing these three things that it's growing. Talk about church growth. Here it is. To achieve our primary aim of soul winning, we've got to become more flexible and more cunning and more clever and more creative. God knows he's blessed the Salvation Army with creativity of a stupendous degree. You saw the people playing about here tonight. Weren't they superb? What clever artists they are. They're creative. They're gifted. God has gifted this Salvation Army with ingenuity. And we don't use it in the cause of soul winning. We need, for example, to develop more and more variety in our corps. When I was a young captain, there was only one kind of corps. They had a kind of a pattern for it. You had a congregation in a certain kind of hall, and then you had a band if you could, you had a song if you could, you had a home league, or else you were in serious trouble. <laughs> you had a Sunday school and you had collections, and you had three meetings on a Sunday. When I was a lieutenant in my first corps, I had three meetings on a Sunday. A Sunday morning holiness meeting, a Sunday afternoon praise meeting, and a Sunday night salvation meeting. Now we call them by fancy names, my brothers and sisters, but those meetings were a deeper life meeting. We called it the holiness meeting. 
a praise meeting. Now we talk about worship as if we've invented it. They were worshipping in the praise meeting when I was a kid in arms, believe me. And the kids ran up and down and everybody sang and everybody swang. And it was a free and easy meeting. And we used to swing from the, from the, from the rafters before you invented this worship business, which I love like my life, but it's been going a long time. It's been going a long time. And then the Sunday night meeting was a salvation meeting. Now they talk about the seeker-friendly meeting. Okay, the Sunday night meeting was a seeker-friendly meeting. It was the meeting when we stood on our heads to make the outside people feel comfortable and to get them nearer to Jesus. It was that kind of pattern. You had to have one of these and two of those. Some time ago, I went to see a call in Sun City in California. I was a DC in California. Sun City is a lovely call. But it's a special call because Sun City is a special kind of town. You can't live in Sun City unless you're over 55. And you can't live in Sun City if you've got any children. They permit dogs, but not children. <laughs> Beautiful place, deserves the name Sun City. Sun shines every day, it rains three times a year, and when it's three times, you know it won't rain again for another year. Blue skies, bliss, but everybody old and no children. But they have good congregations there. I went to see them. And I said to my friend, Glenn, Glenn, how's it going here? She says, oh, we're having a good time. We have good meetings. We have people getting saved. So I said, what's the problem? Have you got any problems? He said, no, I haven't got any problems. Oh, yes, he said, I have. I've got a problem. He said, it's the divisional commanders. Well, we all know that divisional commanders are a problem, don't we? I've been one. I was a problem. I said, what's the matter with your DCs? Well, he says, they're all the same. They come here and they review my work and they say, Glenn, you're doing a great job. I've been here years. And they say, you're doing fantastic, but you know, I'm very disappointed in your core. And I say, what's the trouble, Colonel? And they always reply, well, you haven't got a Sunday school. There's no kids in town, but you've got to have a Sunday school. It's on the paper. You've got to have a Sunday school. If you haven't got a Sunday school, it's not a Salvation Army call. Now, listen, you have the general's permission to tear up all those patterns. There is no typical Salvation Army call anymore. There is a call where souls are getting saved and saints are being made, and suffering humanity is being served, and we don't care what shape, style, or size they are. <laughs> but don't come to me and say, we want to change this and we want to change that, unless the object of that change is to do one of these three things. If it's just to make people happy and comfortable and to entertain them, you can throw it out. Any new idea has to be tried against these things. Will it help the Salvation Army to do these? If it will, do it. If it won't, forget it, however much you like the idea. We can't waste our time on things that don't do something in these three areas. The varied menu is one of our tools. Some courts serve the same menu Sunday after Sunday. It's incredible anybody still comes to the restaurant. There should be at least three kinds of meetings going in any call. One that keeps the kids happy, that want to hear those big noises that most of us have to go like this. You've got to have one of those somewhere. How else are you going to win the kids these days if you don't make a big din somewhere? You need one like that. But maybe you need another kind of meeting, a more reflective meeting, a more introspective meeting, where we look at ourselves and we look at Christ and examine our spiritual position more seriously. Perhaps there are other kinds 
I think one of the things we've got to do is to get hold of people somehow. And I want to tell you that if you're going to win souls these days, you've got to look at the markets. You open any newspaper in England or in Australia, and it goes like this. The first page is the headline news of the moment. The second page is parliamentary news and politics. The third page is business, and the rest of the pages, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, are sports pages. Isn't your newspaper like that? So if you're going to win the people of these days, you're going to have to learn sport. Every court in Australia, where everybody is sports crazy, every court has to have a football team. How are you going to win young people these days if you don't play rugby or football or something? Call it fancy names like sports ministry, but if you don't talk sports for men of this generation, you'll never win them. I've got a 13-year-old grandson, and to my horror, he's a Manchester United fan. <laughs> See what I mean? I was the divisional commander in Manchester, and I was a Manchester City fan. But my grandson, he's a Manchester United fan. He's crazy about it. You should see his bedroom. You can't see the wallpaper for pictures of all the team, you know. His bedspread is in the colours of his team. His pyjamas are a, an imitation kit of the football team he admires. He knows their names. He knows their addresses. He knows their wife's names. He knows what kids they've got. He knows what aftershave they use. He's crazy about Manchester United. Now I want to talk to him. How am I going to talk to him? I don't care a tinker's cuss about Manchester United. <laughs> well, I open the sports page every day. What's Manchester United doing? <laughs> if I've got to have a conversation even with Theo, that's his name. How am I going to do it if I can't talk Manchester United? Listen, friends, if you want to win people for Jesus, you've got to talk to them about something they know something about. As long as you remember that you begin with a sports team, but you're edging round to getting those footballers on their knees as well as on their backs, of course. Anything will do, you know. Anything will do. A common interest of any kind to get people. Anything will do. For example, stamp collecting can be a very good evangelical weapon. Have you tried stamp collecting at your core yet? All that you have to do is to discover that in your town or in your area there are people who are mad about collecting stamps. And then you look around the court till you find the three or four people who are similarly crazy. <laughs> and then you advertise in the local newspaper saying the Salvation Army is starting a club for stamp collectors. And the three or four people who are Salvationists and they love stamps, they run the stamp collectors club. And of course they come and they discuss stamps and then... Once in a while, they get invited to something else at the army. And before you know where you are, some of those who came to stick stamps in their album find the Lord Jesus Christ. You think I'm nuts, don't you? I know a corps in the south of France that has a stamp collector's group for that reason. What are they doing? They're saying with Paul, I became like the Jews to win the Jews. I became like the Manchester United fans to win the Manchester United fans. I became like the stamp collectors and I don't care about stamp collecting to win this. Listen, friends, we've got to be at least as cunning as the devil. We've got to save them somehow. And we've got to serve suffering humanity. 
You know this is a sad world, don't you? Oh, it's a sad world. I remember our British Commissioner, Commissioner Cooper, who served in, Austra in Australia for a while. I remember Commissioner Cooper as our British Commissioner. He used to put his glasses on the back of his head to see his congregation. It was rather a funny affectation, but it got our attention. He used to say, boys, boys, behind every fourth door, there's somebody in trouble. Knock on any four doors, and one of those four has behind it somebody who's suffering. Knock on those doors and find out which one's suffering and minister to that one. One in four are in trouble. I want to tell you, in these days, every other door is in trouble. Some kid, some family's got a kid behind that door who's on drugs. And some people have got a kid behind that door who are in prison. Some kid here has got depression. And some woman has just been told she's dying of cancer. And some woman has just lost her husband who she's lived with happily for 50 years. Behind every other door there's somebody suffering. Thank God there's a Salvation Army who cares for them all. We've got to find out the modern day sufferers and minister to them. You could start with the single parents. You think it's any joke bringing up kids on your own? Some of them manage particularly well, but couldn't you start a group for people who are bringing up a kid on their own and not just thinking of single parent women and thinking of single parent men who are trying to bring kids up and they don't know what to do to group them, to help them, to love them in Jesus' name. That's what we've got to do for hurting society in these days. Just imagine, for example, you know one of the curses of our present days is still something that they haven't been able to cure and that is what we call in England Cot deaths, what do you call them here? Do you use that word? The baby who's put to bed, happy and healthy, and you go up in the morning to wake the baby, and the baby's dead. And you're the mother. You say to the doctor, but why is my child dead? And the doctor says, I don't know. It's one of those things that happens in the first year of a baby's life. Suddenly it's dead and we don't know why it happens. We're studying it, but we don't know. But what does the mother feel? I can't tell you what she feels. I've never been in that position. Perhaps there are some mothers here who have, and you don't know what to say to yourself. You say, what should I have done differently? Should I have done this? Should I have failed this child somehow? And the trauma and the anxiety is terrible. That woman is suffering. Thank God there's a Salvation Army who cares for the hurting and is going to do something, isn't it? For women that are going through that kind of trial. At Staines Corps in West London, they have a club for mothers who have lost a baby in the first year. And who is it run by? It's run by three songsters, one of whom lost a child that way herself. The Salvation Army has to do something for hurting humanity. And I'm not just thinking of our beautiful social institutions who are doing marvelous job for suffering humanity. But every core should have something on its program that addresses some of the hurting people in its community. What is your core doing for the hurting people of today's generation? The Salvation Army was created to do something for the hurting. And if it isn't, it's no longer the Salvation Army. What about this third theme? Salvation Army was created to grow saints. That's why its motto was blood and fire, and it still is. Blood was for salvation. The power of the blood of Jesus to forgive our sins and to wipe the slate clean. And the other word is fire. And it's the fire of the Holy Spirit 
who burns up, as we often sing, in the founder's words, to burn up every trace of sin, to bring the light and glory in. The revolution now begin. Make the people called salvationists a holy people. We used to have every Sunday morning when I was a kid a holiness meeting. It wasn't the best attended meeting. Not by any means. It was the smallest attended meeting. In the afternoon, the praise meeting would be full. and In the evening, the seeker-friendly meeting, the salvation meeting would be crowded. But Sunday morning wasn't crowded. Who came to the holiness meeting? The salvationists who were progressing in their spiritual lives, who were hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And they sang some of those lovely songs about being whiter than the snow. Holy Spirit, come, oh come, let thy work in me be done. All that hinders shall be thrown aside. Make me fit to be thy dwelling. They used to sing with tears in their eyes. They wanted to be like Jesus. Determined to grow like Jesus. Where do you think the prayer was born in my heart, when I was 11 years old, I began to understand that to be like Jesus was the object of every Christian's life. And that's still my testimony. And you're kind enough to sing it for me sometimes. To be like Jesus, this hope possesses me in every thought and deed. This is my aim, my creed. To be like Jesus, this hope obsesses me. His Spirit helping me. Like Him I'll be. You know I learned that principle in a Salvation Army Holiness meeting when I was a kid. I hope you're teaching your 11-year-olds that Christianity is a becoming like Jesus. We were created to be a holy people, a Christ-like people. And we are failing our people in these days by not teaching them how to be holy in this dirty world. You see, the idea has gotten abroad and we haven't corrected it. And here I fear we officers are somewhat to blame. We haven't taught them what Christianity really is. And some of our people who've come and got saved have gotten away with the idea. It's sad to say it, but they've gotten away with the idea that all you have to do to be a Christian is to kneel down and ask Jesus to forgive your sins and abracadabra, hey presto, you're complete, whoopee. Now when the new saved person gets up from the mercy seat and says, I'm there, God loves me, my sins are pardoned. We all applaud and we sing, whiter than the snow, wash me in the blood of the Lamb and I shall be whiter than snow. But then when the dust is settled, if we have any wisdom, we say, now my lad, that's just the beginning. Christianity is more than pardoned sin. Christianity is a long, hard pilgrimage from pardoned sin to Christ-likeness. And if you haven't been told that, then your officer has failed you. Christianity is not a business of getting your sins pardoned and then making a mess and getting your sins pardoned and then making a mess. It is getting your sins pardoned and only occasionally making a mess because you've learned to claim the power of the Holy Spirit to keep you clean and to help you to be victorious and to become like Jesus, gentle like Jesus, pure like Jesus, Honest like Jesus, tolerant like Jesus, unprejudiced like Jesus.
compassionate like Jesus, loving like Jesus. That's Christianity. And if the Salvation Army isn't teaching people that there's more to Christianity than just getting your sins pardoned, it's not the Salvation Army anymore. The Salvation Army was created to preach blood and fire. And if you haven't got a holiness meeting, I'm not going to argue with you. If you haven't got a holiness meeting on your core program, you're not a real core, do you hear me? Now, I know we can't have our holiness meeting on Sunday mornings anymore. In fact, Sunday morning tends to be the outreach meeting when new people turn up and you can't preach meaty subjects like that to people who know nothing about Christ. So maybe it's not Sunday morning now. Maybe it's not Sunday at all, but somewhere in your core program, I look for your holiness meeting. And if you have no holiness meeting, I'm not surprised that you're not making much progress because without the strengthening of the Holy Spirit, no salvationist can win souls or serve suffering humanity intelligently. All right. Let's get back to where I started. Oh, Salvation Army, in every country that I visit, I shall say it. Oh, Salvation Army, please, I implore you, be what God created you to be. An army that wins souls. An army that grows beautiful, Christ-like people. An army that serves the modern needs of suffering humanity. And I promise you something, that God will not withhold his blessing from an army that tries to be what God intended her to be.